Good evening and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Shannon Miller and I'm one of the two Athenaeum Fellows this year. As college students, we all appreciate the value of our education and would hope to see the opportunities we've had made available to others. In particular, many have studied the racial and socioeconomic imbalances present in many schools and tried to discern why these disparities exist and what can be done to level them. Our speaker tonight, Professor Richard Sander, is an, is an economist and law professor at UCLA, and he is here to discuss affirmative action, one of the most prominent and controversial policies that has been proposed to expand access to high quality education for students of color. Based on his research into the impacts of racial preferences in college admissions, Professor Sander argues that affirmative action actually harms students of color due to a phenomenon he calls mismatch, where students are placed in academic settings that they haven't been prepared to keep up with. Professor Sander first described these harms in a widely read law review article in 2004 and explained his research further in his 2012 book, Mismatch, How Affirmative Action Hurts Students It's Intended to Help and Why Universities Won't Admit It. Professor Sander's visit to the Athenaeum is co-sponsored co by the Salvatore Center. As always, audio and visual recording are strictly prohibited. Please join me in welcoming Professor Richard Sander to the Athenaeum. Well, good evening. Um, I'm delighted to be here. It's a, a great tradition you have here, and I'm honored to be part of it. Um, uh, it's also nice to see a big audience. And judging from uh, my dinner conversation, uh, it'll be a, a very interesting question and answer period. So, um, so I want to make sure we have time for that. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk, I think, about uh, three things. One is sort of explain how I got interested in this topic, um, and then discuss the main mismatch results at the heart of my research and the research of other people who have worked on this issue, and then talk about Prop 209 and its effects here in California, because I know that that's, uh, that, that has probably affected a lot of you, and, and you've, you've been observing it. Um, so that'll, that'll probably take us to uh, about 7.20, 7.25, and then we'll do some Q&A. So um, I went to college, very interested in public policy, uh, wanting to do good things. Um, a lot of my classmates in college who were interested in public policy or politics did internships and with their congressmen and, and sort of wanted to get to Washington DC as quickly as possible. And I kind of reacted against that mindset and felt that um, um, a problem with a lot of public policy was that it wasn't sufficiently informed by an actual understanding of the problems that folks were trying to solve. So instead I, I uh, joined VISTA, uh, a predecessor of AmeriCorps, and became a community organizer in the South Shore community on the south side of Chicago. And learned a lot about real urban problems. Um, over the next four and a half years, I worked for a variety of community initiatives. Uh, I, I, uh, I left that field and went back to graduate school shortly before another well-known Chicago community organizer arrived in Chicago. Uh, but, uh, but Obama and I were, were looking at a lot of the same issues and I think influenced in a lot of the same ways. When I went to graduate school, I, I got very interested in um, housing segregation uh, and this joint economics and law program that I did um, required me to find some topic that I could legally analyze and economically analyze and, and housing segregation was, was perfect for that. Uh, I did my dissertation on why uh, fair housing laws seem to have produced large drops in segregation in some cities and not in others. Um, then I worked in law for a little while and got, became a law professor at UCLA, moved out here. Um, so was still very active in fair housing and uh, was president of the Fair Housing Congress of Southern California for a while, which kind of is the main body of providing fair housing services out here. Um, I was drafted to serve on the law school admissions committee 
because they wanted somebody who do some math on the committee. And as I started looking at uh, what we were doing and started doing research on academic support, I became interested and concerned about um, some of what I saw. Uh, the law school was a, a wonderfully diverse place, the most diverse environment I had ever worked in, and I loved having diverse classrooms and benefited from that. But a lot of the students that we admitted were admitted with such large preferences that they had relatively low chances of passing the bar. Um, and because preferences correlated with race, those results tend to correlate with race. So that concerned me. But I, I started becoming interested in, in the issue of how students would fare if they went to different schools. In other words, were the students we were admitting with large preferences at UCLA nonetheless doing as, as well as they would at any school? Or were we actually affirmatively hurting them in some way by putting them in an environment where the competition was, was generally very strong? Um, so, so I started thinking about affirmative action and looking around for data that might actually make it possible to um, study what was happening. And um, I think I was forewarned before I started doing research in this area that affirmative action was, was, not, an, was not a very good career choice as a research topic. Um, it was very controversial uh, and, and not necessarily very fact-driven. Um, for one thing, I realized that the, the statistics that I had learned about on UCLA's um, sort of racially disparate outcomes and its large preferences and so on were not really a secret within the legal academy. Um, most schools were familiar with what was happening to their own students, but almost nobody was doing research on this issue of whether students were mismatched, whether they were actually ending up in the environments that were best from an educational standpoint. And then there was uh, what the Supreme Court was doing. Um, the Supreme Court had taken up affirmative action in, in Bakke against versus University of California, famous 1978 case. And the thrust of that decision by, uh, by Justice Lewis Powell was that it was clearly unconstitutional for schools to use quotas but that it was constitutional um, if they had a narrowly tailored uh, racial preference program to serve the compelling interests of diversity in higher education. It was permissible for them to take race into account as one of many factors that were used in the, the admissions process. So when Bakke came out, it was seen as a sort of pretty big blow against affirmative action. It's like, well, it's possible, but it looks like this is severely restricted. But Powell's opinion, it turned out, was, was written in such a way that it really um, made it possible for schools to argue that even large preferences were consistent with simply taking diversity into account. And when you looked at um, data longitudinally, which was very hard to obtain, uh, but through national databases of small samples and things like that, you could get a sense of what was happening to the use of preferences. And the evidence suggested that there was almost no impact of Bakke whatsoever. Uh, that if anything, the use of preferences spread after Bakke because schools that had said, well, this will get us into legal trouble, now felt that it was okay to do so. Um, so, uh, so affirmative action was an area where there was a lot of kind of uh, myth-making. Uh, not a lot of very good data and even sort of less respect for the idea of doing empirical analysis as a way of formulating good policy. Nonetheless, uh, in the early 2000s, I found myself co-directing a study um, of young lawyers called After the JD that was coordinated by the American Bar Foundation. And uh, that gave me access to another study that had been done by the Law School Admissions Council, which hadn't been released but had fairly useful data, reasonably useful data, on questions related to mismatch. So um, I wrote my initial article, uh, 2004, it came out, actually came out 10 years ago this month, uh, and, and sort of tried to piece together an argument 
about what was happening. And that's the, there we go. And uh, started looking at uh, what were the actual patterns that one can see with the data. Um, the, the initial mismatch argument that I made was something like this, that law schools use very large preferences. These tend to be very stratified by race. Um, and the preferences correlate very strongly with law school performance. And when one looks at outcomes, like bar outcomes, the bar passage rates of students who receive preferences seem larger than can be explained by the difference in credentials. In other words, um, a, a white student who graduates from law school with a 160 LSAT seems to have a much higher chance of passing the bar than a black student who graduates from law school with a 160 LSAT. What makes the racial differential go away is when you take into account their performance in law school, their law school GPA. Then there's no racial effect whatsoever. So somehow it would seem that preferences are systematically lowering the GPAs of the students who receive them. That translates into lower learning at, in law school and that translates into weaker bar passage. That was about the, the strongest argument that I could make based on the data that I had. Uh, but it seemed fairly convincing to some people at least um, because it was hard to come up with any other explanation that could sort of explain the fact that there was no racial gap when you control for law school grades but a large racial gap in bar passage. Okay, so in the meantime, uh, the Supreme Court was um, rendering a decision in, in Grutter and Gratz. These were two cases that came out in 2003. They were decided in June of 2003. They had been brought against the University of Michigan in the late 1990s. One of the cases was against undergraduate admissions at Michigan and the other was against the law school's admissions policies. And uh, these wound up their way up through the courts and Justice O'Connor proved to be the, the deciding vote in a 5-4 decision in Grutter. And O'Connor's decision basically said um, preferences at the undergraduate program at Michigan are unconstitutional because the undergraduate program concedes that they're essentially adding points to students based on the race of the applicant. So they're using what O'Connor called a mechanical process. And that sort of brought back echoes of quotas, so she ruled it unconstitutional. Whereas the law school, she said, was, was within the Constitution because their admissions process was holistic. In other words, each file was considered on its individual merits and race was taken into account in some files to promote diversity. So O'Connor drew this fundamental distinction between these two programs. And to those of us who, who were familiar with the underlying data, this was just kind of a further step into Wonderland because it seemed to have no connection to the actual reality on the ground. And this slide illustrates what I'm talking about. So this compares uh, the undergraduate school's ambitions with the law school's admissions, and it, it essentially translates the credentials of students into a common scale of zero to a thousand, taking into account uh, the grades at their prior school, so high school grades for the undergraduate applicants and college grades for the law school applicants, and their standardized test scores, <coughs> which would be SAT scores here and LSAT scores here. So we combined those into a zero to a thousand scale and gave every student a, uh, a value and then looked at admissions rates according to that number. Obviously, there are other factors that, that go into admissions, but, but this by itself is pretty revealing. What it's showing is uh, at the undergraduate college, uh, the top chart, where a distinction was made between non-minority and minority students, uh, minority including blacks and Hispanics and American Indians, um, <coughs> there's a, there is in effect this, this mechanical process that O'Connor talked about where if you add 100 points to, um, uh, to a minority score, 
you get uh, a majority score that has a comparable emissions rate. So it's above 98% at, at the top tier, uh, it's under 10% in the bottom tier. The numbers, you know, sort of track reasonably well. But when you look at the law school, what you see is a system that's even more mechanical. Here the gap across these cohorts is not 100 points, but 140 points, which is equivalent to 14 points on the LSAT score. It's so about one and a half standard deviations on the LSAT. And you see that the percentages across these tiers match extremely closely. And part of what you could see is that uh, for uh, white students in a score range of 710 to 750, there's a 5% admissions rate. For black applicants in that range, there's a 96% admissions rate. So O'Connor's argument that somehow some sort of individualized analysis is going on here that occasionally takes care of, uh, pays attention to race, but pays attention to all sorts of other diversity characteristics is clearly nonsense. Uh, race clearly is the defining characteristic for, for many, many black applicants. And the size of the preference and the degree of mechanical regularity is greater for the law school than it is for the undergraduate school. <coughs> so um, this underlines, I think, both the nature of preferences at, at, at many elite schools and the difficulty of sort of dealing with this as a policy matter. Because our basic Supreme Court doctrine is, is uh, fashioned around concepts that, that are largely meaningless. When the Supreme Court says holistic admissions, uh, <coughs> it just sort of means, well, don't call it a mechanical process. Just do it. And you can see that illustrated by looking at what happened to undergraduate admissions at Michigan after the Gratz decision. So as I said, the undergraduate system was declared unconstitutional. The college was directed to adopt a holistic system like the law school had. And here's data from two years later um, uh, comparing what happens to black and Asian applicants. So one of the things Michigan started doing after, after the Gratz decision is that they started distinguishing among all individual races. Instead of just having underrepresented minorities and others, they started having differential uh, preferences based on your specific racial group. Um, but you can also see that if you, if you look at these 100 point categories that we had before, instead of the emissions rate being similar for those uh, 100 points below who are African Americans, it's now a higher emissions rate. So the conclusion that you really have to draw from analyzing this data any number of different ways is that Mich Michigan's uh, undergraduate admission system, after being declared unconstitutional for being too mechanical, started using larger preferences in a, in a more systematic way that made finer distinctions among racial groups. And similarly, if you look at law schools around the country, uh, I, I collected data from a bunch of schools from before the Grutter period and after Grutter, you saw a general sort of increase in the degree of mechanicalness and the size of the preferences used by these schools. Here's some data on this, on this relationship between uh, the large preferences and the, and the performance. Um, this is looking at uh, uh, 30 elite law schools. This is from the uh, Law School Admissions Council study I mentioned before. We can't identify individual schools, but we can look at these schools collectively. Um, and what you find is that uh, at the end of the first year of law school, if you compare everyone's GPA, um, about 52% of African Americans are in that bottom tenth of the class, compared to 5.5% of whites. On the other end, only 2.4% uh, of blacks are in the top two deciles, compared to about 23% of whites. Now what's really interesting and important here a fundamental point to understand is that when you control for the size of preferences, 
these racial differences in grading completely vanish. In other words, there's no evidence that these grade effects are being caused by race. The differences are being caused by the size of preferences. So black students who come in with stronger credentials generally do fine. White students who come in with large preferences are likely to be close to the bottom of the class. It's certainly not, a, it's certainly not an individual level uh, an overpowering correlation. But when you look at large groups of people, the correlation is, is very powerful indeed. So as um, research on mismatch started advancing a little bit, we came up with other ways of trying to get it at the phenomenon. And this is what something I call first choice, second choice analysis. This analysis only looks at African Americans. So it has the advantage of not sort of having the, the potential to conflate uh, race with preferences. And first, uh, in, in, this, in this LSAC data set that I mentioned, students are asked about their application behavior. And students who um, apply to uh, what they call a first choice school and got in, but ended up deciding to go to a less elite school can be compared with students who get in and go to their first choice school. So what's nice about that is that you're comparing students who all got into their first choice school and therefore arguably all had the uh, you know, unobserved and observable characteristics to get into that strong school. But they didn't all choose to go there. So you can compare a student who's at a school with a somewhat lower preference with a student who's on average at a school with a larger preference. And what you find is that even though the um, the apparent size of preferences, the nature of the schools that they're going to are not vastly different. The second choice students are still generally receiving a significant preference. But the modest decline in the preference, we think by about a, a quarter of the size of the preference, has a pretty powerful impact on their outcome variables down here. So this shows their percentage passing the bar on their first attempt, which is 66% for the students going to their first choice school and 79% for the students who are going to their second choice school. That's a huge effect for a relatively modest change in their level of potential mismatch. So more recently, in fact, this is just in the last three months, we've been able to get data from individual schools that lets us actually directly observe mismatch by looking at individual students and how far they are from the median at a particular school. So this is data uh, that I've obtained through a lawsuit against the University of California, seeking data from the various uh, um, UC law schools. If we have time, I'll tell you about the experience of uh, suing your boss's boss's boss. Um, but it, it's, it's quite useful because at Davis, the median LSAT is about 160, and at UCLA, the median LSAT is about 164. Um, so the students at UCLA are significantly stronger. That's almost a half standard deviation difference. And what you see is that uh, your rate of passing the bar is very highly correlated with your LSAT. But what you can also see is that the rate goes down in a way that's very related to the distance you are from the meeting of your class. So. Um, this number with this number, and this number with this number, and so on. What you see is that the UCLA bar passage rate tends to correspond to the Davis rate one line lower. Okay? That means that if you are, if you have a 151, and you go to UCLA, you have a 31% chance of passing the bar, but at Davis you have a 51% chance. That's almost identical to what we theoretically predicted a dec decade ago would happen with mismatch. In other words, getting, having a higher LSAT score, having stronger credentials definitely improves your chances of passing the bar. But another really important factor is where you scale relative to your classmates. So you can see in a very tangible way the cost that's imposed on students if they go to UCLA with a large preference. Um, 
So, as the mismatch literature has evolved, we've realized that it's, it's very useful to talk about distinct uh, phenomena of mismatch. And there are, there are three different types that I think are, are really useful to talk about from an analytic point of view. This first one is learning mismatch. And that's the idea that I've been discussing in the law school context. The notion that if you receive a large preference, you're actually going to learn less than your classmates because you're in an environment where the teaching is not geared towards you, uh, the peer groups are going to be less receptive to you, um, you're likely to fall behind in class. And all those things are going to cause you to actually cumulatively learn less. And law school is one of those unusual parts of higher education where we can try to gauge this because there's a measure of how much you learn when you take the bar exam. But another really important type of mismatch is competition mismatch. And that's a somewhat different idea. There the notion is that even if you don't necessarily learn less because you have lower credentials, you're still likely to be at a competitive disadvantage. For example, if you're taking science classes and those classes are great on a rigorous curve and your level of preparation is weaker than most of the students at your college, that's going to be a significant disadvantage in trying to compete in those classes. There's going to be a, uh, a likelihood that you'll get lower grades and there'll be a tremendous temptation to switch to some easier field where the competition isn't as severe. Then the third category is social mismatch. Uh, particularly interesting because it, it goes to the basic rationale for affirmative action, which in the Supreme Court's terms is uh, to try to create a diverse learning environment. Social mismatch research has tended to find that when students uh, form peer groups in colleges or graduate schools, uh, they tend to form friendships and connections and study groups with other students who have similar academic background to themselves. This is an effect that, that trumps race. In other words, social mismatch findings aren't just saying, well, if you, if you have large preferences for blacks and Hispanics, blacks and Hispanics will tend to pal around with other blacks and Hispanics. The, the finding is, is that regardless of race, you tend to find that there's a stratification that correlates with the student's academic preparation uh, before they arrive at, the, at the, whatever educational environment you're studying. So that if you have large preferences, that can actually reduce the amount of social interaction. One analyst at Duke actually did a simulation where he said, okay, so if we reduce preferences by X amount, what would happen to the number of cross-racial friendships? Or what would happen to the number of friendships that students with different levels of preparation would experience? And he found that smaller preferences would actually increase that social interaction. So social mismatch kind of directly undermines a key goal of, of affirmative action and having preferences in the first place. This competition mismatch, I think, is, uh, is mostly easily demonstrated in the, in the science context. And this is a, a chart from what I think is, uh, is probably the best study of science mismatch. Uh, it was done by two psychologists at the University of Virginia, Smythe and McArdle. And they were able to get access to what's probably the best individual level database on higher education. It's the, the College of Beyond database that was put together by Bowen and Bach, and which they used to defend affirmative action in the late 90s. Smythe and McArdle got access to this data, and they looked at persistence in the sciences. And what they're charting here is the degree to which each student diverges from the median SAT at their institution. And they're looking only at students who start out as STEM majors and measuring how likely are they to actually get a, a degree in STEM fields. Um, so the normal outcome is 1.0 which is up from here. And the other outcomes are kind of measured relative to that. So they find that students who have higher SATs than their classmates have a higher chance of getting a STEM degree. Students who have significantly lower relative SATs to their classmates are much less likely to get a degree. Overall, they find that your relative position in the class is 
a close second to your actual level of academic ability as predictors of whether you're going to get a STEM degree to college. This is just looking at about 30 relatively elite institutions. So it's not a cross-section of all American higher education. It's sort of uh, from very good flagship state schools to the top Ivy League schools. Um, so th this, these are the schools that tend to use preferences most aggressively. Again, a key finding here, something that's easy to miss, is that there are actually two lines here that are almost on top of each other. One of these is the line for white, and the other is the line for underrepresented minorities. What does that mean? <coughs> that means that when you look at these STEM outcomes, there is no racial effect once you control for mismatch. Okay? Indeed, you know, uh, it's also the case that, that blacks and Hispanics coming into college in the first place tend to have higher STEM aspirations than, than whites do. Not by a large margin, but very high, uh, in the low 40s. Um, so so this, is, this is showing that if you don't have mismatch, the STEM completion rates are essentially identical across racial lines controlling for academic preparation. The exception are Asian students. And uh, Asians are clearly outperforming all the other groups at all levels. Um, there's some evidence that, that that racial gap has also uh, largely disappeared since this time. This is data from a little more than 20 years ago. And a lot of Asian undergraduates at that time had very high SAT mass scores and relatively low SAT verbal scores. That causes sort of measurement issues that, that can kind of distort the pattern for Asians compared to other groups. But in any case, I think a really important finding is that the white, black, and Hispanic rates are essentially identical. Um, social mismatch has been found in a growing number of studies. Um, essentially, every study I'm aware of, aware of that has looked at the phenomena has found strong social mismatch effects. As I said, uh, one finds that at schools that use large preferences that friendships and peer groups tend to be stratified according to academic preparation. Um, that, um, that large preferences interacting with social mismatch can increase racial isolation. And perhaps most disturbingly, uh, one analysis found that, that African American students who went to largely segregated high schools ended up in, at selective colleges having no more, and actually slightly fewer, white friends on average than they did at their largely segregated high schools. In other words, even though they were in a very uh, racially heterogeneous environment, that wasn't leading to significant cross-racial friendships. There was kind of a spike in the first semester, and then that would trail off during subsequent semesters. And again, that was highly correlated with people's academic preparation. If someone came into a school without a large preference, then their social patterns were very similar to those of other students with similar academic preparation. Um, about a year and a half ago, a major study came out from uh, a group of economists that had been working with the Air Force Academy for a decade. And I think this just kind of sheds more light on the complexity of what's going on with mismatch. So these folks studied squadrons at the Air Force Academy. And a squadron is a relatively small group that uh, you know, does lots of different activities together. Um, so it's, it's a small cohort that you are closely assigned to uh, while you're a cadet. And in their initial research, they found that having strong students in your squadron had positive effects. In other words, they found something that's sort of undermined the mismatch argument. Said, well, it's actually beneficial to have strong peers within your squadron, because you seem to get do better grades, you seem to have better understanding and better connection to the institution. So they said, well, let's take advantage of that. Let's do a large controlled experiment, and we're going to take students who are particularly vulnerable to probation and put them in squadrons with an especially large concentration of strong students. And they ended up um, finding an experiment that perfectly backfired. And they deserve a lot of credit for following through and reporting their results in full. Uh, 
the students that they expected to benefit from this were actually hurt. And the explanation they found was that there was a social mismatch effect that overrode the positive peer group effect. In other words, the academically weak students assigned to the squadron tended to study with each other and tended not to interact that much with the strong group of students within their squadron. So the moral is that social mismatch is real, that there, you can have positive peer effects. It's kind of a question of engineering it properly, trying to figure out the balance of how these different things work. So um, it's definitely, I don't think, a, a question of just saying you should never mix students of diff different ability. The issue is that you want to be mindful of the mismatch possibility and think about that as you're, as you're designing environments. And the problem that we have, I think, in higher education is that colleges tend not to want to do that. They, they consider themselves to be vulnerable legally through their use of preferences, partly because of sort of, sort of the gymnastics that we see in the Supreme Court decisions in the area. They're aware that there are strong differences in, in performance across different cohorts based on students' academic preparation. They're aware of many of the mismatch findings. And their general reaction is, let's not talk about this. And whatever we do, let's not be transparent. Because we'll be exposed, and then our, the students that we're trying to recruit are not going to come here. Let me talk just a moment about uh, what happens after school. And um, you know, it's, it's in many ways even harder to look at uh, postgraduate outcomes than, than school outcomes because it's so hard to sort of understand what's going on in the workplace and draw comparisons across different workplaces and so on. But I've done some research looking at law firms. And law firms are an interesting uh, candidate for studying mismatch because law firms uh, have these up or out systems. They recruit large numbers of first year associates from uh, a variety of law schools. And, uh, and then they essentially put them in a tournament and say, well, some percentage of you will become partners after seven years based on the work you do here at the firm. So work hard and you know, do good stuff. So you can kind of see both the effect of uh, aggressive diversity hiring, which most large firms do, and how that plays out in partnership decisions many years later. So this is data from a University of Michigan database, totally unrelated to the Grutter and Gratz litigation. The law school has been tracking for many years its graduates. It has them fill out a survey when they're 15 years out of law school. And then it takes those survey responses and matches it against data from how the students performed at, at Michigan. So I took uh, thousands of responses and sorted people into 10 deciles. That's this first column based on how they did in law school. And, uh, and then collected data on how many of those students ended up being recruited by large firms and how many of them ended up staying at those firms 15 years later, which was a strong indication of whether they became partners. So what you find in this red column is that grades were a strong predictor of hiring. The deciles were all of equal size. So four or five or six times as many people were being hired in the top deciles as in the bottom grade deciles. But even more striking are the pink numbers, which are uh, purple numbers, I guess, which is how many of uh, the people in, in the red group are still there 15 years later. And the final column shows the percentage, shows C as a percentage of B. And you can see that the retention rates the success of achieving partnership at, the, at that firm is many, many times higher for students at the strong deciles than at the weak deciles. An important thing to know about this data is that it's only looking at white students. In other words, it's, it's avoiding the issue of whether there's discrimination at the firms by only comparing white students with different GPAs. And it's finding all these strong differential effects within the distribution of, of white GPAs. So I think that's a, a strong piece of evidence that something like mismatch operates in some employment contexts too. If a, if a firm uses an aggressive preference to, to hire students who have relatively low law school GPAs, 
those students are very unlikely to become partners. And one can observe this in the aggregate when one looks at the operation of, uh, of preference policies at firms. Um, I want to get to Q&A, so I'm just going to say a few things about Prop 2 and 9. And one of the points I want to make is that um, I, I don't think by any means that affirmative action in general is a bad idea. Affirmative action means a whole bunch of different things. Uh, broadly speaking, affirmative action means that you are sort of consciously thinking about whether the, the methods you use to select people are having um, improper exclusionary effects and trying to counter that if, if they are. I think that's a very good exercise for all institutions to go through. And there's nothing about mismatch that suggests that you shouldn't engage in that type of affirmative action. Uh, my criticisms are about sort of a very specific subset of affirmative action policies, which are large preferences. And again, to sp spin out an implication of what I've said in many different contexts, I'm not talking about large racial preferences, but I'm talking about large preferences in general. Large preferences based on any kind of criterion can have all these different mismatch effects, and one therefore needs to be very self-aware and circumspect and ideally empirically uh, sort of cutting away the underbrush before implementing policies like this to avoid these mismatch effects. But you can see the effects of affirmative action, I think uh, absent preferences, by looking at the initial reaction of the University of California to Prop 209. So, um, so Prop 209 was passed by California voters in 1996. Uh, the year before, the University of California had adopted similar policies, but it had deferred their implementation until it saw what the voters did. And they ended up implementing Prop 209 for undergraduates in 1998. So this is a nice uh, overview of, uh, of what happened at the University of California in terms of overall enrollment. Now note that this is looking at the entire university. It's not just looking at uh, a subset of campuses. Um, and I think one of the things that's very striking, important to understand, is the decline in black enrollment at the UC schools from 1989 to 1997, um, and the stagnation of Hispanic enrollment during that same period. Uh, even though overall enrollment was expanding, that really wasn't, it really wasn't changing minority enrollment. And I think the reason for that is that the university had implemented very large preferences in the 70s as a way of trying to uh, uh, deal with you know, the disparate representation of racial groups at the university, and essentially just used those mechanically. And in the early 90s, um, the results of those were becoming palpably disastrous. And the pressure that led to uh, the regents adopting race-blind policies in 95 was prompted by some of the regions looking at graduation rates and finding that uh, uh, African Americans at some of the top UC schools had um, graduation rates, four-year graduation rates in the teens and eventual graduation rates of like 30% and realized that, uh, that something wasn't working well and pressured the university to try to admit students who can actually succeed. And the result of that was actually decli actual declines in black enrollment. The implementation of, of Prop 209 in 1998 did produce a further decline in black and Hispanic enrollment in that first year. But it also led to a whole constellation of efforts by the university to actually sort of implement other forms of affirmative action, forms of affirmative action that were actually based on trying to improve the pipeline. So up to that point, the leading UC schools had done essentially nothing in the area of K-12 education. Um, and starting in 1998, the universities began to invest tens of millions of dollars each year in various K-12, through especially 9-12 through initiatives. Um, they were especially successful in getting students to take the courses that were required to, to be a UC applicant. But they had reading programs and science mentoring programs and all sorts of things. And the result of that, you can see, is a huge increase 
in black and Hispanic enrollment from 1998 to 2013. Now the Hispanic increase, more than a tripling, is especially impressive. That's partly because of the changing demography of the state. We have many more Hispanics than we did before. Uh, it's also because the general test score gap for Hispanics is somewhat smaller than it is for blacks. But the, even when you adjust for changing demographics, the representation of, uh, of blacks and Hispanics is far higher now than it was before the adoption of Prop 209. This is uh, further evidence that something has actually happened positive in, in the pipeline. It measures uh, the proportion of 20-year-olds in California who had completed high school. So 2000 is a census year, so we have data for that year. And it's, it's pretty close to a good base year because 20-year-olds in 2000 would have been 17 in 1997 when these efforts were just getting started. And the more recent years show the effects of about 10 years of these programs. Now, this is, this, I don't think this statistic uh, proves anything by itself. Un undoubtedly, there were many other factors at work in, in uh, high school graduation rates. But it's nonetheless striking that coinciding with this, we see the largest increase in minority high school graduation rates in any time in California history, and a much larger increase in California than in national averages. Um, this chart shows changes in applications, which you can see are increasing phenomenally. Um, this is showing the effect of outreach efforts, the effect of trying to make sure that uh, blacks and Hispanics nominally qualify for UC admission and that they actually submit applications. So you have huge increases for black and Hispanic applications that are unmatched by any other group. Uh, this chart shows the effect of uh, changing emissions policies to uh, try to better reflect uh, socioeconomic background. And uh, another change that was made was trying to come up with a better measure of high school achievement than the old high school GPA. And various changes were instituted basically as soon as Prop 2 and I went into effect. And they had substantial absolute increases in uh, the percent of underrepresented minorities who are admitted. Um, oops. One of the effects of all this was that almost every uh, underrepresented minority outcome you can trace in the UC system goes up sharply after Prop 209 is adopted. Uh, Four-year graduation rates go up sharply. Six-year graduation rates go up a little more moderately but still go up. Persistence in the sciences has demonstrably gone up sharply for underrepresented minorities. GPAs, the, gap, the racial gap in GPAs has narrowed. So not only has the UC system succeeded in uh, greatly increasing sort of the opportunity of minorities to uh, apply and be admitted to the UC system, but it's also improved their outcomes. Now, a trade-off for all that is that there are fewer underrepresented minorities at Berkeley and UCLA well, that's at least true for blacks. I think the number of Hispanics has gone up. Uh, but in proportionate terms, there has been a, a, a shift from uh, more elite schools to less elite schools within the UC system. But a whole series of studies have tracked that those exact shifts largely explain the improvements in achievement, i.e., students have moved to campuses where their mismatch is smaller and their achievement levels have gone up. Now, I think UC in recent years has taken, uh, uh, has sort of not realized the benefits of its own policies and has in many ways tried to reinstitute subtle racial preferences, sometimes not so subtle, in various programs. We may be able to talk that at, about that in the Q&A period. But on the whole, the early reaction, say the first eight to 10 year reaction of the UC system uh, to Prop 2 and 9, I think it really illustrates the potential for affirmative action to do positive things when it's untethered from policies of using very large preferences. So why don't I stop there and take some questions. We will now be taking questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for Dante or I to come to you with a microphone so that everyone can hear your question. As always, preference will go to students. <laughs> 
Thank you so much for your speech. Um, I'm wondering, so you talk about the mismatch that happens and the potential, um, the unintended consequences of affirmative action. I'm wondering what you think of um, moving affirmative action or some form of leveling the, leveling the playing field earlier on. So because if it is um, derived from you know, uh, early education, if affirmative action or some sort of, sort, of, sort of policy can level the playing field before, wouldn't that get rid of the mismatch problem that you're speaking of? Yes. Um, so do I need to use the microphone? Can you hear me in the back without it? OK, all right, I'll use this. Um, yeah, if we could just get rid of the test score gap, then none of this would be necessary. Uh, that's really hard. Um, one of the reasons that it's hard is that, is that test score gaps appear fairly early. So um, Stephen Levitt and, uh, and Roland Fryer uh, did a terrific study about 10 years ago uh, using extremely good data on um, early childhood. Essentially, they had two key findings. One was that about two-thirds of the adult racial test score gap shows up among five-year-olds. So five-year-old blacks and Hispanics have substantially worse performance than five-year-old whites. The good news is that those gaps completely disappear when you control for seven environmental factors, which include words spoken at home, hours of television, uh, birth weight, socioeconomic status. So, so K-12 by itself cannot fix the problem. It's very important, but even if we had perfect K-12, uh, a significant racial test score gap would probably still exist. We need to simultaneously change family environments. And you know, I think part of the problem with uh, race in America today is that it's hard to talk about that issue, you know? People tend to focus, you talk about the racial test score gap, they say, yep, we gotta, we gotta equalize K-12. That's important, but it's probably somewhat less than half of the overall solution. So addressing that stuff honestly and straightforwardly and aggressively I think is really important. The specific tie into preferences is that if schools can't use the easy fix of aggressive preferences to achieve the cosmetic results they want on a college campus, they then have a strong incentive to pay more attention to the pipeline. And I think the UC example illustrates that. Um, UC spent half a billion dollars from 1996 to 2012, clearly in response to Prop 209, to try to improve the K-12 pipeline. I don't know how well all that money was spent. Some of it has been evaluated. but. Clearly, the change in focus was really, really important. And I'd like to see a national change in focus, similar to that. Hi, uh, thank you for coming to speak here. Thank um, you. So I have, I have two questions for you. So uh, you mentioned that you're, you think some, to some extent affirmative action makes sense. I'm guessing, I'm, I want to, I would hope you would clarify like to what extent and like where do we draw the line like, too much of a racial preference or any kind of preference. And my second question is, how do we hold institutions accountable for causing social mismatch and learning mismatch? You kind of highlighted this uh, when you were talking about black students are from segregated institutions who go to elite colleges are more likely to have less white friends um, when they go to elite colleges. So I'm wondering how do, like, if institutions are like in place and teaching people about like these in inequalities and these kinds of things, like social uh, mismatch and learning mismatch, then would those kinds of solutions happen? And I think the UC system like, tries to solve a little bit of that as well. Great, thank you for those questions. Um, first one, what affirmative, so what a sort of affirmative action would I like to see? Um, the main things that I favor are uh, improved outreach, improved attention to the pipeline, uh, and more socioeconomic preferences. I think if we use larger socioeconomic preferences and smaller racial preferences, we would dramatically reduce mismatch. Because right now, we, schools tend not to use socioeconomic status at all 
Um, so you could get some additional diversity by introducing small socioeconomic preferences. And that would also give you some room to reduce racial preferences. So I think some mix like that would work well, combined with better financial aid for low socioeconomic status students. Um, but the accountability issue is really the key. Because I think, you know, if I had to choose between something like Prop 2 and 9, which I view as, as a very kind of crude scalpel dealing with these things, versus transparency, I think it's an, a really easy choice. The best way to try to create accountability is to, is to have transparency. And encouragingly, the federal government, the Obama administration, has been pushing greater transparency. They've been saying, well, if we're going to have all these expensive new student aid programs, we need to have better data on actual outcomes in higher education. If you could get genuine transparency on a, a dozen different measures of higher education outcomes, which would include things like job placement, uh, how you're doing on your job 10 years later, social interaction on campus, um, some measure of learning, measures of science attrition, and so on. If you had things like that, that any student could access when they're applying to schools and trying to decide where to go, that would, that would create enormous pressure on schools. Suddenly they would have the kind of accountability that, uh, you know, that we have in, in consumer markets. And schools would be rushing to try to address their really bad numbers in a lot of areas. Um, uh, you know, among other things, the school would be very legally vulnerable if you had some social mismatch measures and, and they were trying to argue in court that, you know, they were using uh, their current preference policies to achieve the compelling objective of, of student diversity. So you could say, well, what's, what is student diversity actually producing on your campus? So having that kind of transparency, I think, is, is key to really, as an, as an engine and driver of reform. Thank you for coming. So while I generally agree with your research regarding the benefits of socioeconomic programs, I'm hesitant about the work you've done on racially based programs. And I was wondering if you could respond to Daniel Ho's research into well, basically how when he showed that when you eliminate post-treatment bias from law school GPA and use a more statistically matched pair, he showed that elite schools actually don't have a difference in terms of the bar exam compared to lower tier schools. And I was just wondering whether you could explain a little bit more statistically into your research. Sure. So. Daniel Ho was one of a host of economists who published critiques of my work um, in 2005, shortly after it came out. Um, so I'll just talk specifically about Ho. He, he used this methodology where he uh, tried to match students who had similar characteristics but were in different tiers. And uh, the LSAC database that we both drew on in that work uh, grouped students into six tiers of selectivity. So one was highly selective and six was not selective. So he took students from tier one and tier two who had similar LSATs and undergraduate GPAs and then looked at differences in outcomes and he looked at whites and blacks and he found that generally there were not statistically significant differences. The problem with Ho's method is that the tiers that were used in the LSAC study were fuzzy. There was overlap between each tier. So tier one, for example, was the private schools in the top 30 and tier two was the public schools in the top 30. So since he only picked out students for his analysis that had the same credentials, he was picking students from different tiers but probably actually went to very similar schools like Berkeley and Northwestern. There was no way one could tell from his analysis whether these students actually had different levels of mismatch at all. So um, an economist named Doug Williams did a reanalysis of Ho's analysis and actually there's another economist, uh, two other economists, one of whom is named Peter Sidiakono. They just did a reanalysis as well that's coming out in the Journal of Economic Literature. And they both found the same thing. They found that when you, when you did host test with a better measure of individual credentials and distance from the mean of your school, then you did get a mismatch result. So I, I think his research was fallacious. What was, what was interesting about, about Ho's work and more broadly sort of the academic reaction was that there were, there were a number of strong liberals supporting affirmative action who published critiques who basically I think said, you know, Sander is, 
Uh, he's got some good data, and he's got some pretty good analysis, but he's not nearly as sophisticated an economist as I am. So I think I can bury him with uh, an analysis that will come to an opposite conclusion and be very technical. Um, and they were sort of right because, you know, four or five of these critiques came out in 2005. And I think what had been a genuine movement towards uh, changing some law school practices receded. Um, you didn't have any economists from the middle or the right kind of jumping in. They saw affirmative action as too hot to get involved. So it was only over a sort of a five or six year period that a lot of those studies were carefully evaluated. And uh, they universally flopped. Uh, one, Catherine Barnes, who wrote one of these studies, actually published an apology for her, her initial research. Well, we showed that it was, <laughs> I mean, she didn't really have much choice. In it. it was really bad, but, um, <laughs> you know, but, but five or six years later, it was, it, the, the, the effect of that was somewhat muted. So, uh, you know, the dynamics of research in this area were, were problematic. I think that, that balance has changed a little bit now, but it's still an issue. It's hard to really get a, a good, the kind of robust debate that you would get in other areas of social science that aren't so sort of ideologically polarized. Hi, thank you for speaking today. Um, my question is, when you were researching these schools that had strong preferences, did you take into account any of the existing support systems um, for students who would be admitted because of affirmative action? For example, um, systems that supported um, students of first generation. Oh. Um, and when looking into these systems, did you see if the gap um, if the learning gap decreased at all? Um, it can. So, as, you know, as I said at the beginning, I got into this through a study of academic support. And I'm a big believer in the potential of academic support. So, you know, I think if a, if a college, well, imagine a situation where you do have transparency and colleges, um, you know, have to publish data on actual mismatch problems that their students are having. One way that colleges would probably respond to that would be to increase their level of academic support. And if you follow the best practices in the academic support literature, I think there are a number of strategies out there that are, that are really good. Um, there are many others that are, that are ineffective and there are some that are terrible. Like, you know, I, I don't know if you heard about the University of North Carolina created a whole shadow system of courses for um, athletes and other students in academic difficulty where they, they just gave A's uh, and, and these courses were shams and you know it, it's, it's a big scandal it's kind of an unfolding scandal that's not good academic support um, but there are, there are lots of ways of, of doing academic support that can that can address the problem um, or at least address parts of the problem so I think academic support is part of the solution I don't think it's a complete solution because to really make academic support completely fill this gap, you would almost, you would essentially have to create a parallel curriculum, at least for the first year or two. And that can, that again, sort of undermines the whole point of creating the diversity on the campus. It can be a helpful way of getting wealthy schools to invest resources in, in underprepared students. I'll give you one, one more interesting example. Uh, so medical schools, uh, have, their students have to go through three sets of boards. And the first set of medical boards is at the end of your second year of medical school. So that's very different from law schools where you take a bar exam after you graduate. What you find is that medical schools take ownership of mismatch effects. You see very similar phenomenon at medical schools that you see with the law school. You see these uh, large disparities in, in how you do on your first medical boards based on uh, the gap between you and your classmates. So, although there hasn't been a really good study done yet, I'm, I'm confident that the mismatch effects are very similar. But the medical school says, well, you're still a medical student here. So, when you come back in your third year, we're going to try to address the problem. So, most medical schools have extensive academic support for third year students who flunk the boards. And they take it again, and they, they generally end up passing uh, both medical school and their boards. 
it isn't a complete fix for the mismatch. I think there are still lingering problems that you see in sort of future specialties and licensing and even malpractice rates. But, but it's, a, it's a significant commitment that medical schools are making to try to address the issue. Whereas law schools completely ignore the bar passage differential. They sort of say, okay, well, so those students will never become lawyers. I guess they won't give much money to the school. But at least they're not here anymore. I mean, it sounds, I'm making it sound extremely callous, but I, I really feel strongly that the schools are incredibly callous. They just don't pay any attention to those students. Hi, thank you for speaking. Um, I was just wondering, um, you kind of brought up or referred, or you know, like um, made an inference to um, just kind of the inherent unease that kind of floats in the air whenever we broach uh, a really controversial topic like affirmative action. And I was just wondering, given your own racial identity, if you had any personal observations about doing the research that you've done when you first set out to answer this question, first of all. And um, second of all, what advice would you give to students who might feel unqualified to broach certain topics um, given their own identities? Um, well, that's hard. Um, I think uh, I think when I started doing research on this, one of the reasons that I decided to go ahead and do it is because I felt um, I felt a lot of inner confidence about my racial attitudes based on my history, some of which I've told you. But uh, my first wife was African American. My son is half African American. Uh, I've lived in majority black neighborhoods most of my adult life. So uh, I think a lot of whites um, feel uh, a level of guilt that I don't feel. And that makes it easier for me to work in this area. Um, and uh, and I think I also felt that my reputation for the civil rights work I'd done would inoculate me from some attacks, which it did. I think I underestimated how much uh, would nonetheless happen. Um, so, but I think I think what you're, I think it is a huge problem because because uh, it means that a lot of good research that needs to be done isn't done because people are afraid to engage in it. Um, there are some initiatives going on at a few schools called Uncomfortable Learning, which are basically ways of trying to um, uh, get schools to explicitly deal with the importance of, of research and ideas that um, raise uncomfortable questions. And I think that's, those are really important initiatives because the, the trend in higher education has been exactly the opposite. It's been to uh, towards comfortable learning, uh, to try to suppress even conversation in the classroom about issues that are seen as hot buttons because it's seen as insensitive. Um, and I think we need to elevate the consciousness of both faculty and students in higher education of the vital importance of talking about uncomfortable issues on a regular basis. My sense is that this forum does a, a good job of that. Hi. Uh, so, um, two questions. Um, how, um, in this political climate, in today's political climate, how possible do you see it that um, income levels for families will substantially increase and funding for K-12 education will substantially increase enough to counteract the benefits of, you know, affirmative action? Because um, you list that as a possible solution. So, in this political climate, how likely is that to actually, you know, produce any tangible, uh, you know, substantial results, especially since colleges through private funding won't be able to solve the system by itself. Um, so be, depending on your answer, does this change the value of um, affirmative action on campuses simply because there might be no possible short-term solution either from the federal government or through private, private donations to fix the system enough? Um, and the second question is, um, going back to a little bit to the institutional accountability, um, do you think that colleges should improve their um, academic uh, and administrative diversity within their campuses, be, along with increasing their racial 
uh, student diversity. Because um, a lot of that is kind of like the intangible uh, results of like not being able to compete is that a lot of times as a student of color, as a low income student of color, um, you feel um, alienated because nobody looks like you. Especially if people in power at the college don't look like you or don't come from backgrounds like you. And so that kind of alienates you within the classroom and doesn't allow you to perform as ac academically well as you might well should. So does that, do those factors, do, do those you know, intangibles factor in any part into your research? And if they do, how, how so? Okay, good questions. Um, on the first one, let me just be clear that I think the value of addressing mismatch in higher education exists independent of whether we do a better job of the pipeline. In other words, the pipeline is going to, as narrow as the pipeline is, we are reducing the effectiveness of the trickle of um, underrepresented minorities who reach the selective schools through the programs that we're following now. We are significantly reducing the number of black scientists that we would have if we were more conscious of the mismatch issue, for example. Okay? So independent of, of solving K-12, we need to address higher education mismatch. But I do think that there is uh, meaningful hope for reform uh, because the, the per capita resources going into education actually has increased pretty substantially since the 1980s. And in the last 10 years, there's been a huge increase in the amount of kind of um, experimentation, controlled experiments being done at the K-12 K-12 level, the efforts to try to increase accountability. You know, No Child Left Behind is highly controversial and ineffective in a lot of ways, but, but the idea in No Child Left Behind is to try, to try to create measurable outcomes in some way and try to create accountability around that. So however that evolves, I think there is a growing sense that we need to try to um, try to improve transparency and accountability in K-12 and try to implement things that work. So, so I actually see, I, I see more hopeful change at the K-12 level than I've seen at the college level over the last 10 years. On your second question, um, I think, um, you know, I, I think certainly you can have uh, encrusted, unresponsive administrators who can aggravate the problems of minority students on campuses. But I think that it's too simplistic to say the solution to that is to um, increase the racial diversity of administrators or something like that. Certainly being conscious of those things, having the, having the types of affirmative action that I talked about in terms of outreach and thinking about selection criteria, I think that definitely applies to faculty and administrators as well as students. But the real answer to what you're talking about, I think, is to do better research on uh, sort of the mechanisms of alienation on campus. What are the things that actually factor into that? And trying to, try to go more deeply than just kind of what does the administration look like, but what are the actual programs? What are the actual interactions that happen? Which ones work, which ones don't work? That is, fortunately, that's all the time that we will have. Uh, please join me in thanking our speaker, Dr. Richard Sander.